Hello. Welcome to uh, learn with me about executive functions, or in other words, called directive behaviors. Uh, this is a recording uh, meant uh, for master's level university students, uh, for example, uh, with uh, engineering backgrounds. And to um, introduce uh, uh, some of the uh, concepts, but also go into uh, quite much detail. And I hope you will find this inspirational. And uh, I really encourage um, further learning. Uh, you can also uh, find many videos on YouTube uh, that go more in depth uh, in, in some of the concepts that I will be talking about. So uh, to introduce myself, I'm Iro Askelanen, a full professor in systems neuroscience in Aalto University, uh, which is located in Espo, uh, Finland. So let us go forward. Uh, when looking into what are executive functions, um, I could start from history. And um, okay, so we've, had um, uh, brain damaged uh, patients with executive function deficits uh, throughout the history. But perhaps the first documented case of executive function disorder was Phineas Gage. Uh, you can see a sketch of uh, him on the, on the left, in a picture I found from the internet. Uh, and this is post accident uh, sketch. Uh, he was a railroad construction worker, um, and he suffered a, a horrible accident. Uh, he was uh, tamping uh, explosives with an iron rod uh, to all uh, in the ground. Uh, but then the explosives um, um, went off, and, uh, and this uh, iron rod uh, um, flew through his frontal lobe. The frontal part of the brain. So it entered uh, underneath his uh, cheekbone and then uh, came out uh, on, the, on the top of his head. You can't see it here in the sketch, but um, well, previously I've made um, for a, a book of mine this illustration approximately showing where the iron rod entered, where it uh, came out and, and on its way, uh, which uh, brain regions uh, destroyed, and you can see here uh, exactly the the area of the frontal lobes uh, of the frontal cortex, uh, but also uh, beyond uh, where uh, destroyed. And so, what happened uh, in this case uh, to Phineas Gage uh, is that, uh, according to uh, reports, uh, he didn't lose consciousness, uh, which you know is not something um, that would be unique to his case. Also, we know that uh, there are many um, uh, persons who have been shot to head in, in wars or uh, or uh, got a, a fragment from um, a grenade uh, uh, that penetrated their skull and they didn't lose consciousness, but were able to walk to uh, the first aid. And also in, in this case, I did not lose consciousness. Um, and after recovering from the, the acute uh, phase uh, of this injury, uh, something uh, quite spectacular, interesting uh, happened to him. His personality changed. So previously he was a well-mannered, considerate person. Uh, then he became very irritable spontaneous, impulsive, and and he could not uh, hold employment uh, any longer. Uh, also, uh, uh, his close relationships uh, suffered. And so um, he, in other words, um, by his horrible injury, suffered um, a loss to uh, executive functions. Uh, and okay, so let's take a more modern view into this. Uh, that was in the 19th century. 
and and what type of functions do we have today that characterize executive functions? So executive functions is sort of an umbrella term that that holds many many functions that are intertwined. Um, so there is uh, first of all tension or control, uh, selective and sustained tension, uh, ability to uh, inhibit uh, competing responses. Then there's a shifting of cognitive sets, ability to fluently switch between different mind and, and response sets. And okay, so here actually you can see some key words. Uh, so for the key student, uh, you might wish to look up selective attention. How is it defined? Um, uh, what type of neural mechanisms uh, uh, there are underlying selective attention? Uh, and then, you know, ponder on how it relates to executive functions. The same for the shifting of cognitive sets. As well as working memory, uh, which uh, here I put parentheses, process memory. Uh, I think it's a um, better term. It's a more evolved understanding of, of um uh, at least short-term memory, which is um, very close in concept space uh, with working memory. Uh, then there are things like self-reflection, self internal speech, planning, uh, setting of goals, flexible alteration of goals uh, when one um, faces some difficulties or some obstacle comes up to whether we're not whether we are or not able to flexible uh, uh, change of goals, uh, uh, this very much relates to executive functions. But also motivation, uh, that which relates to the goals that basically uh, drive uh, us and uh, uh, very much determine what we pay attention to, uh, what kind of cognitive sets we have, what kind of material we have in working memory, um, what kind of self-reflection, internal speech and planning we're, we're uh, uh, going uh, forward with. Um, uh, so motivation is, is a really, really key aspect of executive function as well. Uh, and then uh, emotions on the other hand, emotion regulation, these play a tremendous role in motivation. So in this sense, um, executive functions, they also tie to these many other functions. Uh, I wouldn't say emotion is an executive function per se, but you know, underneath, uh, it, it's what gives the drive to uh, motivation and, and then uh, emotion regulation. Uh, yes, I would say this one could see as being part of executive functions, so we're not carried away by emotions, but rather rather can uh, control it. Uh, and then we think of clinical relevancy. And, and here uh, we talk about disorders of the mind, whether organic or uh, caused by psychiatric disorders or neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, they're all characterized by uh, by cognitive deficits and uh, executive functions. For example, in case of schizophrenia, are really uh, at the core uh, of the cognitive deficit. And this, what makes this very relevant is that um, cognitive deficits we know are the strongest predictor of poor outcome in schizophrenia. And of course, this can be explained by um, the patients who have um, more intact executive functions, being able to do mental work, being able to um, uh, sort out the challenges in life, uh, less stress, less vulnerability. Um, whereas the, the ones who have deficits in executive functions, um, they are less able to function, they are prone to more stress and, and why that um, they more easily uh, get uh, psychosis and, and uh, 
uh, repeated uh, episode of uh, psychosis. Something we know uh, is that traditional IQ tests largely fail to capture executive function deficits. And why so? So traditional uh, intelligent quality tests um, that are used also as, as basic tests in neuropsychological exams um, consists of tasks that are quite well structured. So there's the um, uh, clinician who is who's running the test is telling the patient, do this and do that, and do this and do that. And th this way, the, the, the patient doesn't have to figure out himself, you know, what to do next. Um, but rather, it's, it's very nicely given to him. And, and these patients, they can follow instructions. And, and due to this, there are several tests uh, that have been developed that access or assess uh, executive functions. These include word fluency, stroke color word interference, Wisconsin card sorting, and multiple errands tests. And let's let's take a look at uh, some of these. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are multiple uh, other um, executive function uh, tests, but uh, but uh, um, you know this. I hope uh, give you a flavor. Of, of the type of tasks that um, uh, capture these deficits. So here's a, a stroke test, a simple version of that. Um, in different runs, the person is to read uh, what is written. So purple, yellow, red, black, red, green, red, yellow, and so on. And then in the, so this is the baseline control method. Uh, how fast did they do and uh, you know did they make errors? I and mean, typically people would not be making many errors here. Uh, even the the patients with uh, executive functions uh, deficits. But then in the in the test condition, uh, response inhibition is inhibited. Because it's a very automatic response, at least in grown up uh, adult people who are literate. to read what is written here, to read purple and yellow and red. But now one is supposed to uh, name the color uh, with which this word is written. And then there's a conflict. So instead of reading purple, yellow, red, they are to say red, blue, green. So they have to uh, inhibit the response to read and then name the color. And then it's slower. You can try this out yourself a bit here uh, and see how it goes. Um, and typically people who don't have deficits, they of course slow down, but prefrontally damaged patients. And, and here you can see some of the uh, regions uh, encircled uh, uh, where um, um, there have been associations between uh, these these areas and test performance. Um, uh, and then you can also see uh, uh, these are uh, partly also the uh, areas that Phineas Cage um, got damaged in his accident. Um, so, so what happens, we, we have prefrontally uh, damaged uh, patients and what is typical for them is they are slower and then they uh, uh, commit these errors of in interference. So they actually uh, occasionally or quite often even read what is written and don't name the color. So they fail to inhibit this automatic response. Uh, then there's the Wisconsin card sorting test. And, and here actually is the first uh, link uh, to another YouTube video 
uh, in which you can see um, um, uh, an example of how this test is uh, delivered. Uh, so you can follow the link and um, uh, take a look. And so Wisconsin Carter sorting test, um, just briefly, is one where uh, there are uh, cards that have basic geometric shapes of different kinds, triangles, circles, squares. Uh, there are different numbers of them, and they are written with uh, or printed with different colors. And then uh, uh, the experimenter uh, simply places uh, four cards in, in front of the uh, patient and gives the, the rest of the cards as a stack to the patient and says, okay, so for each card, uh, you should match to one of these four cards. And then the patient uh, starts to try and uh, you might uh, match by color. So, so you know, he gets this card with two uh, blue dots and you know, there's uh, uh, you know, triangles with blue and he, he matches there. The experimenter has decided, okay, shape is the uh, matching criteria. Uh, says uh, incorrect. And then the patient continues uh, and then once he um, figure out, okay, that is the shape, he tries it. So then the experimenter says correct and lets the patient to do um, well on, on a few trials after, you know, to learn, okay, so it's, if this is matching by shape, this is so easy. Uh, but then the experimenter, without uh, any prior warning, the patient decides that, okay, uh, now the um, categorization uh, changes. So instead of shape, uh, uh, the patient will from now on get the correct response when he matches by color. And then, of course, the, the patient is perplexed. So the shape doesn't work out. And he has to figure out, okay, so this classification criteria changed and I need to find a new category to match and, and, and then, you know, go on from there. And, and here uh, we see uh, errors. And a lower number of categories attained, you know, going through the whole stack. Also, there's increased perseveration. Uh, perseveration uh, means here that uh, the patient would continue to match the cards by shape, even though the experimenter says it's not correct, it's not correct, it's not correct. Um, there have been uh, some studies where they have uh, looked at uh, uh, um, relationships between different brain regions and uh, and then uh, this uh, set shifting uh, tendencies and as you can see uh, here um, there are these uh, anterior lateral prefrontal areas uh, that are uh, even in the orbitofrontal uh, regions uh, that um, correlate with uh, with the number of uh, perseverative uh, errors. This is looking at regional cerebral blood flow measures. But even these, these neuropsychological tests that uh, are designed to measure executive functions, such as the Wisconsin card sorting test, SOOP, and work forensic. They often fail to predict grave difficulties that patients will exhibit in their daily lives. And, and uh, this sort of call forward uh, for development of uh, yet other types of tests. And here um, they develop multiple errors tests uh, to help detect such problems. Um, and this means that um, the experimenter is going to a shopping center with the patient, gives a list of tasks 
for example, to mail a letter or buy milk rules, um, buy the milk only after mailing the letter, for example, and a time limit. So then the, the patient has a, you know, there's multiple tasks in the shopping mall and, and a, you know, a certain you know, set of rules. And then uh, the experimenter uh, writes down, uh, okay, uh, so, you know, patient forgot to do this and that, did something extra, um, uh, you no know, spur of the moment, um, uh, failed to inhibit the response, for example, to buy ice cream, um, and then uh, also, you know, didn't follow uh, the rules. And here you can see a uh, task submitted, for example, forgetting to mail a letter, uh, partial task failures, uh, for example, buying stamps and writing address on the letter, before getting to mail a letter, or putting excessive stamps on the letter before mailing. A uh, number of rules broken, uh, for example, to keep spending under a certain amount to buy mail because the last item that it does not get warm. Uh, so errors across these different categories contribute to the total score. And now, of course, as technology has progressed, uh, we can have multiple errors tests uh, also uh, in the virtual reality environments. So virtual reality-based multiple errors tests potentially allow for more accurate analysis of actions, decisions, and failures uh, during the test in real life, the multiple errors test. And, and this is also possible to combine with neuroimaging. So a patient uh, can be placed in the functional MRI scanner, for example, uh, and then uh, his brain activity can be scanned while he's uh, carrying out this multiple ends uh, task. Another possibility provided by modern technology is to record eye movements during everyday behaviors. And here um, I took this uh, um, picture from uh, Frontiers in Human Neuroscience uh, from, I think, a very exciting uh, study. Uh, here you can see these uh, glasses uh, uh, that record with small cameras the eye movements uh, of the uh, participants. And also there's this camera that captures the frontal view. So then by putting together these two pieces of information, what is it there in front? You know, what is the field of vision of the experimental subject? And where are her eyes looking in this field of view? Uh, then uh, one can figure out, okay, so here, uh, this particular experimental subject is eyeing a, a, a tag uh, of this uh, 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 items uh, shop. And here's uh, some very interesting uh, findings. A uh, quote from this article. We tracked eye movements of 42 participants while they ran an errand on a university campus and subsequently assessed their personality traits and well established questionnaires. Using a state of art machine learning method and a rich set of features encoding different eye movement characteristics, we were able to reliably predict four of the big five personality traits. You can see the traits, as well as perceptual curiosity, only from eye movements. So, uh, this is something very interesting. So the patterns of eye movements with which the person is collecting information is uh, guided by these different uh, big five uh, personality uh, uh, traits. And you know, something might be sort of intuitive here, so the extroversion, uh, maybe, you know, the, the article doesn't uh, tell this, but maybe they're more looking at uh, social cues uh, you know, where are different uh, other people and, and, and whether 
uh, there would be opportunities to engage in some kind of, you know, social interaction. Uh, neuroticism uh, would be um, uh, something, something, uh, um, you know, uh, do with, uh, you know, checking and double checking things and, and so on. But I think it's really exciting that that machine learning uh, can classify based on these eye movement uh, features. Uh, these different personality disorders, and and not personality disorders. I'm sorry, but but personality traits, and so uh, uh, this is actually something that could be used uh, as an add-on in a, in a real life multiple earnings test. Just uh, give the patients these glasses, and then oh, that's a very good recording. Uh, accurate recording of, of what's going on, what are they looking at different uh, phases of their endeavor. And, and then uh, there are some even further possibilities uh, by a, a tracking of body location and poster. So there are these high-tech possibilities uh, for multiple error type of real life observations uh, uh, via uh, in inclusion of uh, uh, body location and posture tracking, how I many you know, sensors placed, different parts and joints, uh, hands, elbows, and so on, and feet. And then one would be able to um, see. Uh, uh, reconstruct the actions of the uh, patient and put this together maybe with information from these eye movement glasses. And then, for example, uh, maintaining personal space, uh, tendency to mimic postures of others, and that would both occur as failures of inhibition as the prefrontal damage uh, could be captured uh, by by this means. And I would say also um, this sort of video-based analysis, so uh, they have these glasses and, and the video is being recorded, you know, what is their field of vision, what's in their field of vision. This is greatly helped by, uh, by uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, computer vision algorithms that have been developed uh, in the context of uh, autonomous driving vehicles. So then one can annotate, okay, so there are these persons and this and these positions, there are these objects of different sorts in the field of vision. And okay, so this patient is looking at that object and then, you know, starts to approach that object, reaches out. Uh, so Putting all this information together, uh, uh, we can have uh, very nice tools to, uh, to study executive functions and their deficits. And okay, going from multiple errors tests to uh, something more elementary level. Uh, this is uh, a, a really exciting finding from the area of selective attention. And selective attention, I would uh, like to say, uh, is filtering of stimuli uh, for further processing, filtering stimuli by attention. And, and in this seminal uh, paper uh, from 2003 by Chris Fritz uh, and, and, and colleagues, um, uh, you can see uh, that there are dynamic shifts to receptive field properties to attended stimulus features. Um, and okay, so here I actually quote more in this in chapter six of the book. So uh, if you're interested in, in looking at a sort of basic level introduction uh, of these um, concepts, um, in, in fact, in, in general cognitive neuroscience, uh, please look up my book on bookbone.com. Uh, and the book is called Introduction to Cognitive Neuroscience. It's freely free to download. Uh, the, there are ads 
placed in the book that play, uh, pay uh, for the for the processing costs uh, of this book. Okay, so how how was this how was this uh, discovered? Uh, here you can see a cryptic figure from this paper uh, on the right hand side, uh, and I will explain. I'll walk you through here. So uh, you you have this temporally orthogonal ripple complex stimuli. Uh, so these sounds. Uh, so I mean, this is the sound frequency, and this is time. And you can see this is a certain kind of um, uh, stimulus that has this broadband uh, fluctuation, um, but involves all sound frequencies. So there's gliding sounds here, different kinds of gliding sounds here. They, they a little bit sound like uh, computer uh, game stimuli from the 1980s to be quite honest. And then, of course, the idea here is that uh, these uh, kinds of sounds, they differentially uh, stimulate auditory cortical neurons. So in this experiment, uh, the experimenter is recording from, from different um, single neurons in the auditory cortex of the experimental animal, in this case, the ferret. Uh, and then this, this particular neuron responds to certain, uh, certain aspects. And in certain places, during this um, different stimuli, the, the neuron is firing. And from this, it can be calculated which aspects uh, in this torque stimuli uh, the neuron was firing. One can also do this experiment by presenting white noise. And the white noise will just randomly have uh, these aspects that the uh, given neuron is responsive to, but it's much slower process. So these torques are uh, more effective in teasing out the receptive field properties of these auditory cortex neurons. Okay, so now there's this way of uh, measuring auditory cortex uh, uh, neuronal receptive fields, spectrotemporal receptive fields. For example, here, a certain uh, so a short sound of certain um, frequency uh, really drives this neuron. Um, but then, you know, uh, they, they can uh, take a look at how does tension modulate uh, these uh, responses. Uh, so here you can see an experimental animal. He has a passive um uh, condition is just listening uh, and you can see the spectrotemporal receptive field of this particular neuron is responding to a sound of uh, a bit over uh, eight kilohertz but then um indicated by the zero uh there's a target sound the signals the availability of water the, the animals get a little bit thirsty um, and then uh, uh, he hears this the signal sound uh, and knows that there's availability of water. And so he starts to pay attention to the signal sound. When, when is it worthwhile to press the lever? And um, here we can see then uh, something quite miraculous happens. Is the receptive field of this particular neuron, which is the baseline, Passive condition looked like this is encompassed to include um, this sound frequency. And if, if one looks at the difference of uh, spectrotemporal receptive field, which is calculated here, uh, it's as if there was a, a center excitation surrounding emission pattern uh, stamped on uh, uh, the uh, receptive field. So via these top-down influences, what happens is that the number of units uh, reacting to the signal sound goes up because when the signal sound frequency is close to the receptive field, uh, then uh, we have these additional units that are reacting thanks to the enlargement uh, of this um, 
spectra and proreceptive fields of this single neuron. So in this sense, the fundamental um, filter settings in the auditory cortex, even in the primary auditory cortex, are changed um, uh, so that then these uh, sounds that are goal uh, relevant uh, get uh, processed, noticed uh, more likely than others. And then we have this evidence from human imaging studies indicating that these processes are very rapid, so within two seconds. Uh, and then here you can see, uh, actually this is one of well, from one of my own publications, um, and and you know the temporal uh, accuracy uh, uh, of uh, in this experiment was a little bit limited, but um, but it was uh, you know this time bins within thirty seconds from switching a cue, uh, and and there you can see uh, ignored uh, produced responses of of lower amplitude than, than, than this standard. Uh, and this, these were from an experimental paradigm uh, where we uh, looked at the release from inhibition and this way teased uh, out this you know, potential changes in receptive fields, filter settings. And it seems they're very rapid. So uh, within a couple of seconds, uh, they could be even faster, but but our paradigm was uh, limited in this fashion. Now going uh, on to uh, more uh, uh, complex attentional uh, tasks. Um, uh, here's an example uh, from a study where we investigated effects of uh, perspective taking on brain activity. And so we had two groups of subjects. And, and the first group was to was watching this uh, movie clip. Uh, this was from HBO series Desperate Housewives. You can see here a cartoonized uh, version of this for copyright purposes. Uh, this uh, um, series was uh, shown to the subjects in you know, 10 minutes part of from the series was shown in the subject in the fMRI scanner uh, and and they pretended to be forensic detectives. They were asked to uh, uh, detect you know when um, when is uh, um, um, uh, who who is guilty of uh, murder. And then they switched the task to a uh, decorator, so interior and exterior decorator. So how would you improve the interiors and exteriors uh, seen in this um, 10 minute clip? And then the group two, uh, they had the reverse order. Uh, they first uh, took uh, the task of being uh, decorators uh, followed by detectives. And something we used uh, was intersubject correlation uh, approach. In this analysis approach, uh, the subjects were seeing the movie in the scanner, their brains are aligned, and then for each brain location, time course is extracted. And, and since this is a fMRI, uh, the time course involves a uh, blood oxygenation dependent uh, signal, which is uh, slower than neural activity, but but correlates uh, um, with certain aspects of uh, neural activity. So it's proxy of neural activity. Uh, and here you can uh, then see that the time courses of subjects um, exhibit a certain level of commonality. Uh, and there are these pairwise correlations are calculated, and then the average is obtained. And we get the inverse correlation map. Then we can contrast between uh, perspectives. Here, first of all, you can see with uh, warm colors where uh, uh, brain activity was more similar, more highly correlated across subjects when the uh, subjects assumed the roles of 
forensic detectives with, with cold color and blue, blue color. Uh, you can see where uh, the opposite contrast um, um, was significant. But overall, there were more areas uh, functioning more similarly across subjects when they were detectives than when they were the decorators. Uh, here you can see um, where uh, the activity was uh, significant or of higher significance uh, when uh, looked at within perspectives versus across perspectives. And you can see areas that are often attributed to uh, visual processing and attentional controls, uh, which would be this posterior parietal cortex, lateral, lateral occipital uh, uh, complex areas. But also places like the parahippocampal uh, gyrus, which uh, have to be memory. We can see how uh, adopting this different cognitive sets, um, paying attention to um, materials relevant for the forensic detector versus the interior decorator, here the decorator uh, perspectives, they, they shape how attentional, uh, visual uh, um, processes are run. Uh, as, as well as what kind of uh, memory material is uh, retrieved. Um, but it's not so universal that, you know, irrespective of what kind of different perspectives we would give to the subjects, they would always exhibit differential activity uh, in, in those specific regions. Uh, for example, we uh, had in a subsequent study, um, contrast between uh, two social perspectives that were watching uh, a movie uh, called uh, My Sister's Keeper, uh, where uh, one of the sisters is sick with cancer, the other one is supposed to donate uh, a vital organ, refuses to do so. And now these experimental subjects are taking uh, the perspective of the ill sister or the healthy uh, sister. Uh, and you can see these differences um, uh, in uh, intersubject correlation of brain activity, depending on which perspectives they were taking. And this is a little bit more messy picture than, than uh, uh, the results are quite scattered, but one could uh, maybe uh, see evidence towards uh, something like uh, that uh, moral processing is, is more synchronized in the in the case of organ donor perspective and then empathizing or empathy related responses might be um, more similar uh, when uh, adopting the perspective of the sick sister. And so looking across different types of studies uh, uh, you know, to reach some conclusions, the results across our studies perspective has been manipulated, suggests that the human brain flexibly adapts to support different perspectives as a set of brain areas involved, right? So when empathy is needed, there is supporting empathy or recruited. So, I mean, this makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, however, some uh, areas seem to be involved uh, consistently across all these studies, including if your temporal occipital areas, the cuneus and posterior cingulate areas, TPJ and lateral occipital complex. So TPJ means temporal parietal junction. These areas may be once involved in perspective taking regardless of specific requirements of the perspective task. Another very interesting uh, um, uh, set of structures 
in the brain that have to do with um, uh, control of executive function involved in it uh, are the, the basal ganglia that have direct and indirect pathways. Uh, and, and then there's this um, small nuclei called uh, substantia nigra uh, at the base of the uh, brain. You can see here in this picture a lot of uh, circuitry where uh, uh, ex uh, excitation is inhibiting inhibition, and then this inhibition is um, uh, inhibiting more inhibition. So this like double inhibition, uh, for example, and 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 this is quite a uh, key mechanism uh, here. Uh, without going into any uh, further details, uh, um, I refer you to uh, to a very excellent two minute neuro, uh, two minute neuroscience uh, videos on direct and indirect pathways uh, of the substance nigra. Um, we have a, a, a specific disorder, a neurological disorder called Parkinson's disease, where the destruction of nigrostriatal dopaminergic neurons leads to difficulties in initiating movements. And beyond the movement control, Parkinson patients suffer from sticky cognition, so they have difficulties in shifting your cognitive sets. Uh, this is not only initiation of movements, but the initiation of thoughts, which is uh, disturbed. And, and basal ganglia play a very significant role in shifting of attention, shifting from one goal to another. Also, uh, there are these exciting uh, uh, findings from, from animal studies where they can actually use this two photon calcium imaging uh, techniques to, uh, uh, to, to look at uh, activity of, of all neurons uh, across the patch of cortex. It's a very exciting new uh, technology. Uh, and, and what they found, for example, in this study is that uh, mouse call directed uh, licking behavior requires premotor cortex. Uh, so, activity in these areas harness widespread single neuron activity across other brain regions to drive and coordinate the call directed licking behavior. So, these, these motor areas uh, uh, they have to do with planning and you know, coordinating. Uh, other brain areas to uh, try forward uh, coordinated actions. Another good example of the involvement of motor neurons collect behaviors beyond guiding uh, limb uh, movements. Maybe it was uh, traditionally thought that the uh, motor cortex uh, simply guides limb movements, so the, the hand goes this and that way, but but it's uh, uh, it's more uh, fundamental, uh, also indicated by these findings that uh, Parkinson patients exhibit sticky cognition um, because they have this deficit in substance nigra, which for a long time was thought to be uh, part of uh, fine motor coordination. And, and, and like I said, this two photo whole cortex optical calcium imaging combined with focal optogenetic inhibition uh, uh, represent new exciting methods in animal neuroscience metal. And, and what does this optogenetic uh, inhibition mean? Uh, so basically, there are these techniques not only to record from, from all these neurons, you know, the patch of uh, cortex simultaneously, but one can select certain individual neurons. Uh, and then inhibit or turn up, ramp, ramp up the activity of these neurons with these uh, uh, laser uh, uh, techniques. So this is uh, really, really exciting. And okay, back to the uh, human. Uh, this is uh, 
um, a famous model of working memory uh, where there's a central executive and then there's the phonological loop, visual spatial sketch pad. Uh, so the phonological loop with uh, uh, all uh, short term duration verbal materials like when you're remembering a phone number, uh, visual spatial sketch pad when you're in your mind figuring out rotating some figure or something. Uh, and then there would be connections to long term memory and senses. And the central executive uh, is something that sort of arranges this memory materials. And this is not the only sort of compar compartmentalized model of uh, working memory. There are others as well. Uh, but I would like to advocate a, a bit more modern uh, view in working memory. So these traditional working memory models are based on the idea of memory stores where information is entered into them, how information leaves them, what their capacity, and how information is subject to interference or decay. And these models were originally inspired by computer analogies of human cognitive functions. As in computers, the CPU and RAM are separate pieces of hardware. Um, but now there's recent evidence pointing um, to uh, the rather, uh, uh, there's a process memory. So the CPU and RAM processes are carried out by the same neurons. And, and, and how is this possible? So I tried to explain in the following. And here you can see, uh, if you want to look up uh, this, this uh, was introduced by Ray Hassan and colleagues in uh, Trends in Cognitive Sciences in 2015. And, and then you can see here, uh, the basic arguments uh, 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 that in the majority of real life processes, past information is used continuously to process incoming information across multiple time scales. So, considering single unit electrocorticography and functional imaging data, um, his authors argue that virtually all cortical circuits can accumulate information over time and further. Time scales of accumulation vary hierarchically from early sensory areas with short processing time scales. Uh, so from uh, tens, uh, 10 seconds to, to hundreds of milliseconds to higher order areas with long processing time scales uh, from, uh, from many seconds to, to minutes. In this, this hierarchical systems perspective, memory is not restricted to a few localized stores but is intrinsic to information processing and unfolds throughout the brain in multiple time scales. And so, so just to illustrate this a little bit more, so real life prior information continuously influences the processing and as an information. And for example, in language comprehension, uh, each syllable is interpreted in the context of a word. It's word in the constant sentence and it's sent in a situational context. Uh, so here, the boy took the ball and kicked it into the goal. So how do we know what, what this it means, ball? There has to be uh, somehow information in the system. Uh, the, the state of, of some of the neurons are altered uh, when this ball is um, uh, encountered in the sentence. And then uh, it's possible to make this connection that this it uh, refers to the uh, ball. If there wouldn't be um, this type of uh, temporal window, uh, then, then this it would always just be processed as a, as a, I mean, and, and then no one wouldn't be able to, to track across time the accumulation of information uh, from spoken language. And so th in this way, uh, the, the, uh, the viewpoint goes from how is information stored and then retreat for later processing uh, on to how does prior information continuously shape processing in the present moment. And this way, uh, we're going from systems memory to memory systems. Uh, that each and one of the 
sensory systems, for example, have some memory. And then, you know, as one steps up the cortical hierarchy, uh, maybe there's longer duration memory, more abstract uh, events are, are memorized and so on. And these ideas are not entirely new. For example, there are various neuroscience by neural network, uh, artificial intelligence models, as well as connectionistic models or theories that contain the same basic logic. Let's take a look at another other example of temporal receptive windows. Uh, so temporal receptive window would be defined as the window of time in which prior information from an ongoing stimulus can affect the processing of newly arriving information, as was written uh, in, in one of the uh, articles by Rialzo's group. Uh, I, I chose here the, the longest word in English, uh, anti-disestablishment parianism. It's taken about two seconds to other. In my own uh, native language, uh, Finnish, we have uh, uh, much longer words. Um, um, but English in general uh, is a language with very short words. And then uh, let's take a look at, at, at the processing uh, across two different um, temporal receptive windows. So then we have a very short one. Uh, and, and this would be looking at the level of the phonetic unit. Uh, and here you can see at the level of phonetic coding in brainstem structures, very short adaptation time constants. So brainstem doesn't adapt. So whatever is there at this moment, is what drives the neurons. And the history doesn't really much affect. But then we go to the level of cortex. And here, to extract meanings of words, accumulation of information over longer time is needed. And, and for example, middle temporal gyrus is such hierarchically higher order structure and higher order than brainstem. And then, because the information accumulating across time, uh, one can make sense of, of single words. And now it seems uh, that uh, there is such a hierarchy that uh, as one steps up from the sensory areas on prefrontal parietal areas, uh, uh, then uh, there are increasingly long temporal receptive windows. So that uh, frontal areas uh, very much care what happened 30 seconds ago, uh, whereas auditory cortices don't really so much. Uh, here you can see uh, figure findings from from a 2011 uh, paper by Lerner, uh, Julia Lerner and uh, colleagues, uh, and and they uh, took an audio story uh, and then they scrambled the story uh, different levels. So they took paragraphs and you know reordered paragraphs. Uh, so they're you know quite long, semantically quite long uh, pieces of intact um, uh, uh, information. So I you know what is happening within the paradigm and then scrambling on the sentence level. So the, the paragraph level uh, information gets destroyed. And then the word level, and then find the backwards. And, and you can see they looked at things of the correlation in these different cortical regions um, with these different scramblings. And, and what they saw that when the, the story was background, um, played back, backwards. So one cannot really understand what's going on, but you know, this uh, auditory features are uh, retained. We see inches of the correlation mostly in the auditory areas. When uh, words are intact, the disorder is scrambled, uh, uh, the activity uh, spreads to uh, anterior, posterior, and lateral um, uh, aspects, um, but still confined to the superior lateral uh, temporal lobes, pretty much. But then uh, going to sentence and paragraph level scrambling, uh, we can start seeing those um, parietal and, and frontal areas. 
and this is really interesting um, because um, there's something in these intact paragraphs uh, uh, that that contain information across uh, these longer time constants that are important for prefrontal cortex. So people hear uh, these paragraphs more similarly, and and there's there's this inside correlation uh, in these regions. So this is one clever experimental manipulation, I would say, that allows one to uh, pinpoint you know, where are these uh, regions in the brain that process information across different uh, temporal receptive uh, windows. Something which relates to temporal receptive windows is event segmentation. And this is also important uh, from the perspective of uh, executive functions. It's known that humans naturally segment continuous experience and events. Uh, and the segmentation is driven by event boundaries, uh, which can be defined as moments in time when prediction of the immediate future fails, or moments in time identified by observers in the transition between events. And the example of the boundaries in movies uh, would be change in location, change in action, change in protagonists, or change in time. Uh, so you can think of a, a scene in a movie where people are having breakfast, uh, and then uh, all of a sudden uh, there's a tradition uh, to a workplace. And and here is a very clear event boundary. Also in our real life, we have these uh, uh, events. So for example, now I'm uh, giving this um, uh, lecture, uh, recording it, you know, once I'm done, you know, so then um, I'm no longer in, in this mode of giving the lecture. I'm going to do something quite else. And uh, why why should I have the memory materials and other cognitive tools activated that help me give this lecture when, for example, going to uh, walk outside or cook a meal or something, uh, or perhaps go to the store? I haven't yet decided uh, what I'm going to do after this recording, but I but, uh, hope you get the idea. Um, and, and then it, it sort of uh, makes sense uh, 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 to sort of wrap it up and then open a new uh, window. And, and then when we wrap up, you know, we sort of, okay, so this is done, you know, put it to memory and then, you know, uh, let's see what's going on from, from here on. Uh, uh, these moments of transition are event boundaries. And here's a real life example. Talking the phone with a colleague as one walks to a restaurant, it ends the call and starts inspecting the menu. Uh, so elements within an event are bound together more cohesively than elements across events and long-term memory. So if we Remember back to the phone call. Uh, we can sort of trace, you know, what was taking place in the phone call. But but those events, they they they, they are not they are not tied to uh, what was taking place when we we're inspecting the menu and and the other way around. Uh, so it seems at the end of an event, hippocampus quickly replays the contents of the event as the window is open for the new ongoing event. Uh, and event segmentation is a function closely related to longer temporal receptive windows. Uh, I hope you can see this connection uh, between the two. Uh, you know, when one paragraph ends and another begins, there's an event boundary. And also, um, it has been shown that uh, that these uh, temporal receptive windows are are not the kind where you would see that okay in this particular location in prefrontal cortex is 32 seconds. Now, if the speaker is slower or faster, also these temporal receptive windows, they shrink and 
uh, length and Here you can see uh, uh, some findings from a study by Aya ben -Yakov. And by the way, um, I really encourage you to also uh, look at the original literature, uh, read these articles. Uh, they contain uh, a lot of uh, interesting information, you know, if you have time. So um, uh, this study, uh, uh, looked at the hippocampus specifically. And, and you can see here at the zero, there was the uh, event boundary, two, two different uh, uh, types of data. And, and then there was this, um, uh, these, these events were rated for salience uh, by different raters, you know, to what extent the raters uh, agreed with high, medium, or low salience. And then uh, based on the uh, salience, uh, there was this peak uh, in the uh, hippocampal activity after the event. Uh, so hippocampus is reacting um, at the event boundary. And this, this finding sort of support this, this model that uh, hippocampus is then uh, maybe storing information um at, at the event but but so uh there, there are there is activity in other structures uh, as well it depends on the event boundary type yeah uh, you can see some color coding from um study by zax and another so uh, changing calls character character interaction object interaction role uh, space and you know, multiple different types uh, and you can see these different cortical areas involved in different types of uh, um, uh, event boundaries. Another fundamental principle by which information uh, is stored in the brain seems to be distributed patterns of activity in the addition to neural populations. And since memory is very much tied with executive functions, so I'm also bringing this forward here. Uh, here you can see um, how the study was adopted in lateral occipital complex um, as an fMRI study. And, and what they found that uh, different uh, everyday objects had the specific uh, signature patterns of activations and deactivations in this lateral occipital complex. So, when pictures of butterflies uh, versus chairs versus birds uh, were presented, uh, for example, here, uh, birds uh, had sort of this pattern of uh, activations across a certain set of voxels. Uh, it was consistently similar uh, compared to chairs. Even though these pictures of birds were from different angles and now different kinds of birds. And from the perspective of information processing, uh, this is a very efficient, these kinds of sparse distributed patterns, they are very efficient way of coding information. Um, also, uh, a theory that I very much like and which also relates to exterior functions uh, is, is by uh, uh, Moshe Barr. Um, uh, he is advocating that the brain is proactive, that it continuously generates predictions to anticipate the relevant future. The analogies are derived from elementary information that is extracted rapidly from the input link that input with the representations that exist in memory. And this generates focused predictions by associative activation of representations that are relevant to analogy. And predictions in complex circumstances, such as social interactions, will combine multiple analogies. So more complex scripts in other studies will be mapped to increasing anterior peripheral cortical areas. Uh, such predictions need not be created afresh in new situations, but rather rely on existing scripts in memory. And the scripts 
very important and are the result of real as well as previously imagined experiences. The media structures of the default mode network along with the hippocampus are important for this. Her brain is constantly running scenarios of possible future events and then these scenarios are stored for the future use. So you can imagine you're sitting in Boston and basically doing nothing, but your brain is not really doing nothing. You know, you're going through in your mind in different kinds of scenarios, maybe of how would you react if somebody said to you this, and, and then you would say that, and you know, maybe I would need this, and maybe I would need that. Uh, and you know, what if this happens around the house, you know, how do I fix and so on. And, and this is quite uh, useful because uh, you know then we have this these uh, uh, scenarios of, of of possible outcomes and how to react to this door, and then you know, we face that situation or or close enough situation in our lives. We don't need to regenerate, you know, think, you know, how would I, you know, act in this situation? Of course, yeah. Uh, from time to time, we really are uh, caught by surprises. And then we need to invest uh, quite much uh, mental capacity to uh, figure out the solutions. But uh, a lot of time, uh, we have something in store. And here you can still see this uh, contextual association network and how uh, it overlaps with the default uh, network uh, of the brain. So default node network of the brain uh, is, is a network that was identified uh, initially as resting state network. Uh, it was this observation of, okay, so uh, we put experimental subjects into the scanner and then uh, they don't have any task. And still we see that certain brain regions uh, uh, exhibit activity that correlates with the activity of certain other brain regions. Uh, and at the time, initially, it was it was not so terribly exciting finding you know, in my mind, uh, since maybe the assumption was quite naive that that okay, if the, if the experimental subject is placed in a scanner and he has no tasks, so then you know there should be like no brain activity, uh, and you know the brain would go idle. Now, of course, it doesn't it doesn't go idle. Um, there's daydreaming and, and other things. So there's actually um, uh, you know, multiple studies uh, looking in, into what kind of mental contents and processes uh, dominate. A lot of that is, is social scripting uh, in this idle uh, conditions. Uh, here uh, is a, a, a uh, theory uh, um, published in Brain Research in 2011 by, by me and some colleagues. And basically this relates to this uh, process memory idea. Um, but we also speculated that uh, short-term plasticity uh, would pretty much be the neural, basic neural mechanism that would underlie uh, is uh, uh, process memory type of uh, uh, phenomena. Basically, there are these adaptive time constants uh, that go from short to long. And at the same time, we have receptive field sizes, level of abstraction of neural population representations going from small to large. So this level of uh, abstraction going from small to large. Uh, and then uh, we would have uh, uh, adaptation and, and also um, you know, bottom up and top down. Uh, and then all this together, these basic principles acting together uh, would um, allow for something like interior frontal cortical representations, events, schemata, uh, at the one end and at the other end in subcortical nuclei a filter in a sensory input space to elementary features. Uh, 
Another um, important theoretical concept that relates to exterior functions is somatic marker hypothesis. And this ties emotions with the exterior functions. So uh, this is a, a theory uh, advanced by Antonio Damasio. Uh, it says that anticipated emotional reactions guide behavior and decision making. So, uh, so we, we have this gut feeling and then we're not supposed to do this. Uh, uh, and, and this sort of you know, guides us uh, in life. And, and, and then what Antonio Damasio observed that uh, when there's orbital cortex and victim damage, uh, then and this emotional biasing of decisions uh, does, that doesn't work. So these this patients don't really have this, uh, that the emotional reactions, the anticipative emotional reactions would guide their behavior and they make, you know, they're very impulsive, just like uh, Phineas Cage. Uh, when we expand from this concept, uh, we get to emotion regulation. Uh, and, and here, a uh, great deal of emotional reactions are very fast. So assessment of whether a stimulus is threatening, for example, this happens in just in an instant. Uh, and humans have capability of regulating their emotions. Uh, for example, if a conditioned fear response would be counterproductive in a given context, it can be dampened by peripheral cortical mechanisms. Uh, emotion regulation can also boost emotions, like if we're wanting to build up anger prior to calling customer service or a company who sold a product one is unhappy with. You know, I wouldn't really, you know, uh, suggest you to do this. Uh, there are better ways to be assertive than, uh, you know, plain angry. Uh, and, and here you can see uh, a very interesting uh, um, article on. Uh, emotion regulation by Dixon in Psychological Bulletin 2017. Uh, and there are uh, the schematics of, of uh, uh, how, for example, reappraisal of uh, uh, past and future events or others' intentions uh, uh, is driven by different uh, uh, circuitry. And, and, and then what, what kind of uh, Roles these different areas in the network play. For example, ultra subjective feelings. Um, um, there, CCC and insula. But a lot, lot of you know, big role in emotion regulation is played by this prefrontal cortical uh, structures. Also. Uh, there are these differences between different uh, personality traits and these personality traits, uh, uh, of course, determine, you know, partly what kind of goals, how do we uh, act, you know, how do we react, how do we pursue this kind of uh, And here you can see, uh, for example, politically conservative um, are more cautious against changes uh have larger um, i mean actually who are more cautious about changes have a larger amygdala than politically liberal the persons with difficulties in anger management different from others in their emotional regulation in the picture are not i'm talking about changes that correlate with big five i mean there were this previously these eye movement patterns that correlate with big five and, and here you can see some some brain correlates of uh, uh, big five. So I mean, this would be maybe food for thought uh, uh, for you. You know, uh, in what in what sense do these? Uh, um, uh, make sense. Uh, for example, uh, why is the medial orbital frontal cortex has to do with extroversion? Uh, uh, and, and and so on and so forth. So as conclusions, executive function is an umbrella term referring to higher cognitive functions and the underlying neural operations that enable and facilitate cold direct behavior. Attention and filtering of stimuli, memory representations that guide behavior, somatic markers that link emotion and decision making. 
This Likert test largely failed to capture deficit in executive functions. The Stroop and uh, Viscosin card sorting tests specifically assessed them. While the errors test based on virtual reality or real life with measurement of eye movements, body postures, the large possible laws in the future study executive functions and also clinically assess them. The motor system works much beyond just motor function, but synchronizes several other brain regions for collaborative activities and clinic planning as such. Thank you very much uh, for listening to this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was inspirational. And uh, I will be providing uh, some more lessons in the future. <laughs>